And now we will have somewhat a shift in subject matter to talk about some of the technological solutions for these challenges. So the next speaker will be Yoram Cohen. You already got mics. Whoops. Oh, well, <laughs> Yoram Cohen is a distinguished professor of chemical and bio. Um, Biomolecular, thank you. Biomolecular engineering from UCLA. Um, he is also the head of the Center for Water Technology Research at UCLA. And unusually, he holds a dual position. He's also the head of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. We're fortunate to have Yoram here as he's one of the top experts in the world for water treatment technologies and particularly for desalination that can be applied to solve exactly the kinds of problems that Hussein outlined. So, Yoram, thank you. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Uh, can everybody hear me? Well, uh, first, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, both uh, Aaron and Ellie uh, for inviting me and uh, for the uh, uh, Center for uh, Water Research and uh, also the Center for Jewish and Israel Studies uh, for putting uh, this event. Uh, I was quite ambitious uh, when I started to prepare this uh, presentation. Uh, but then uh, Ellie told me that I only have two hours, <laughs> so I cut down the presentation uh, quite a bit, and uh, it'll only be an hour and a half, Ellie. <laughs> all right. But in all seriousness, uh, I am uh, an engineer in training, uh, but a humanitarian in my profession. So uh, today, what I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit of a mix uh, of both. Uh, digging into what has gone on uh, in Israel over the years and uh, being involved uh, with Israeli scientists over the years, both in terms of collaborative research and also in my position as an adjunct faculty at uh, uh, Ben-Gurion University. Uh, I've got to learn quite a bit about uh, what is going on in the Israeli you know, scenery. And uh, the nice thing about working in the water area is that scientists in the water area tend to collaborate a lot more in, the, in other areas because we don't buy and sell water. You know, we basically exchange ideas and technological solutions. So with that in mind, you've heard about water scarcity. So what you see here in red is essentially areas of the world where there is physical water scarcity. Obviously, Israel is, is in there. And I'm going to focus on Israel right here. Although we've talked about Israel, let's just very briefly talk about its water resources, not many. Uh, you have the coastal aquifer, which is in purple, and then you have the uh, mountain aquifer or the central aquifer, which is in uh, red. And you see that basically it uh, crosses boundaries, or let's say that uh, geopolitical boundaries, other boundaries, really don't uh, uh, make much of a difference as far as the aquifer is concerned, all right? Or let's say water doesn't care about uh, political boundaries or other type of boundaries. Israel also have the Sea of Galilee in there, uh, or the Kinneret, as it is known. And I will uh, go into that in a, in a minute. Uh, the area, much like where uh, I live and do my research in California, has similar climate, not a lot of rain, uh, and uh, a pretty big uh, ocean. And we'll talk about that too to see how that uh, connects. So, because Israel didn't have a lot of water, and I remember that in my uh, childhood about the uh, biggest event, and this is the construction of the uh, national water carrier to bring water from the Kinneret down south. And actually, as a youngster, when I was in Israel, my, my first uh, one of my projects uh, in school was to compare the uh, national carrier and the California aqueduct. You know, of course, at that time, I didn't even imagine that I would end up being in California. So that was a major uh, effort and made a big difference in Israel. But remember, at that time, the Israeli population was quite small. It's about 8 million today. At that time, it was about a million and a half or, or thereabout, or close to two. So obviously, that was not enough. And so uh, one other element, just to, to let you know, is that uh, the region itself was not new to the idea of water conveyance. So what you see at the, at the little inset in there is actually an aqueduct that is along the coastal region just south of uh, Caesarea. The Romans you know, were quite uh, proficient 
at building aqueducts all around the world, and that's what really made the Roman Empire really thrive. So uh, here we are in the modern era, and we have the uh, uh, Israeli Amovil RC, or the national carrier, uh, which uh, has made a big difference in those early years. But that, of course, was not enough. So if we look at Israel's uh, current uh, water strategy, in order to provide its needed water resources, there was a need to develop new potable water sources. Now, at the same time, to provide water at a quality and quantity, which is according to demand. And I know that later this afternoon, Naftali will talk to you a little bit, I think, about the issue of agriculture, water for agriculture, and what sort of quality uh, is needed there. Now, water production from what I would call non-traditional water sources is needed in order to provide an additional portfolio or portfolios of water because it is important for water resilience and you heard in just the previous talk about that importance. So you don't want to put all your eggs into one basket, so to speak. And how did Israel do that? Well, uh, desalinated uh, seawater, which was really a driver at the beginning of the 21st uh, century. Desalinated brackish water in the 1970s started in a lot. Uh, it was also seawater to some extent, and then later on the addition of uh, brackish water, and of course treated wastewater for various purposes, mostly uh, irrigation. So that's what I, I would call non-traditional water supplies. Now, just to give you a, a very brief uh, view, if you look at freshwater utilization in Israel, uh, you'll see that about 57% or so is residential and industry. You'll see on this uh, pie chart that only about 32% is for agriculture, but that's a little bit misleading because this is fresh water. And in Israel, they also use uh, uh, treated uh, wastewater. Now, typically, agriculture uses somewhere around 68 to 80%. In California, it's 80% you know, for agriculture. So Israel has managed to fill its portfolio for agricultural and landscape irrigation through water reuse, which is very important. So those of you that are interested in numbers, uh, the annual consumption of fresh water is about 14, 24 million cubic meters per year. And if you like acre feet, it's about 1.16 million acre feet per year. Now, this is fairly recent uh, data that comes from the Israel Water Authority in their recent publication. Now, what is very interesting is that if you look at Israel uh, consumption per capita, and I'm just talking about residential, so it's not overall water use per capita, it's fairly low. It's about 65 gallons uh, per person. You'll see that it has grown uh, over the years, starting from about the 1960 up to 85. You see a little dip and I haven't really looked into it to see what was the reason for that dip, uh, but you see that there was a climb again at around the 1990, but then it's been brought uh, down again uh, around 210, and, and it's roughly about 65 gallons per day. Now that's in comparison to about uh, the consumption in the US, which is about four to five times that much. So, when you talk about how great you know, uh, the state of Israel is in terms of uh, handling its water resources, it's also reducing uh, individual consumption. And it's through education, not just technology. I remember as a kid where they would say, you have to worry about every drop. Okay. And, and this has, you know, over the years, where even today I'm paranoid, so at home if I see that the water is dripping, I'll go in and turn that tap off. So that is, is critical. Now, in order to be able to develop non-traditional water supplies, particularly desalination, because I'm sure many of you uh, have heard in various sources that water desalination is very expensive, and so I will address that. And so uh, in order to make that into a viable option, the first thing that you need to do is to control the water market. And by controlling the water market, it means that controlling water as a national resource. And this is something that is not well uh, realized in the United States. Uh, in California, in Los Angeles alone, we have over 200 you know, different water entities, water districts, water purveyors, and you name it. And the prices go from zero to 
you know, a huge amount. It goes up to two, three thousand dollars an acre feet. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are those that have riparian rights and have to pay very little or none for their water. So if you want to push a certain technology or a certain type of water that is costly, you have to control the market. And Israel does that you know, very well. Now, uh, it also means that you have to balance the cost for different consumers. And this is something that is also done in Israel in terms of the cost of water for urban versus uh, the agricultural society. And you tax natural water resources to meet uh, the level that is needed for desalination. In other words, let's simplify what I've just said. If you start making water more and more expensive, eventually desalted water seems pretty reasonable in price. So uh, the other is to promote water reuse and brackish water utilization. So to develop high quality water, to work with uh, uh, farmers, with those in the agricultural sector, uh, so that the appropriate water is available for their use. And finally, technology for development of new sources. So all those things are necessary, but you also have to have the technology. So I'll touch briefly upon uh, the major aspects of technology, but in technology specifically for desalted water, which will be the major part of my uh, talk, we have to worry about energy costs, we have to worry about overall project costs, we have to worry about process uh, robustness, and as we heard also uh, just in the previous talk, we have to worry about all sorts of mishaps, some intentional and others perhaps natural. And in Israel also, there was a, a, another major issue, is to improve or change the water distribution system. Because the minute that you provide water that is non-traditional, such as treated wastewater, uh, they're not piped in the same pipes. So if you drive through Israel, you'll see purple pipes okay, in various places. You also see that in parts of the US, in Southern California, you'll see purple pipes, and you'll see the signs everywhere in the various gardens, this water is not for drinking. In terms of seawater, because in the process of desalinated, we remove many of the minerals, even if there is some remineralization, then you have to worry about the distribution system because water that is heavily demineralized is also corrosive. So there are technical elements that have to go into making sure that you have the right blend of water. And of course, environmental issues or environmental concerns that have to do with the fact that uh, desalted water is not done at 100% and I'll touch upon that uh, briefly. And so there is a residual stream, and what do you do with that residual stream that is typically of higher salinity? And when it comes to using water that is uh, treated wastewater, especially in recent years, there is concern about cumulative effects when you use uh, wastewater, and particularly concern with various uh, contaminants uh, with respect to uh, what we call emerging contaminants, uh, things that were not in our water streams uh, long ago, and now they're there, pharmaceuticals and others that are more resilient. So, uh, briefly, in terms of investment in technology, and I'm highlighting areas in which uh, you, you've heard about some of it already, where Israel has improved in order to reduce the uh, amount of water that is used in agriculture through drip irrigation and actually uh, what I would call precision irrigation as well, evaporation control, biolo biological treatment of wastewater that has actually led to the whole idea of uh, membrane bioreactors, improve wastewater oxidation methods, even genetically engineered plants that would be able to use more saline water and I'm not uh, by no means uh, a person who, ha uh, who is uh, into agriculture or has a green thumb, anything that I try and grow dies. And, and so, my, but my wife is the great uh, uh, agricultural you know, uh, scientist in the family. She has her own vegetable garden and uh, we eat very expensive salads. Uh, but in any event, the last one is advanced thermal and membrane-based desalination. Even before what you've heard about as reverse osmosis uh, desalination, Israel was a pioneer in the area of thermal desalination. Nowadays, more than 50% uh, or close to 50% of the world capacity in terms of desalination is from membrane-based uh, systems. So with that in mind, you know, there was a, a lot of technology that had 
to go along you know, with all the other aspects of controlling the uh, water market. So I just thought it would be nice to show a nice uh, slide with uh, uh, various aspects of agri That's the only slide that I have on agriculture right, in here. So you see drip irrigation with a beautiful uh, flowers in there. I have no idea what they are. Uh, you'll see that uh, there are basically the equivalent to you know, greenhouses where there is precision irrigation. Uh, there are also nowadays in Israel quite a bit in terms of aquaponics, vertical farming, and maybe you'll hear about it this uh, afternoon. Again, all of it in order to drive the use of water down, all right, to produce more for less water. Now, uh, wastewater treatment, of course, is, is critical. And this is uh, municipal wastewater. One of the largest plants is uh, in uh, Rishon Latzion, the, the Shavdan uh, plant. I think some of you here uh, visited uh, this plant not long ago. Uh, I believe that there are plans to actually move uh, some of the treatment uh, facilities you know, further uh, away uh, <coughs> because the whole area is becoming more and more of an urban you know, area uh, in Israel. But that's a major facility for treating uh, wastewater. Now if we summarize and look at uh, treated wastewater or water reuse on a, on a global level, Israel uses about, uh, recycles about 82% of its wastewater. Some say it's up to 85, others will say 80, depending on the source that you, uh, uh, that you have, compared to the U.S., which is about 10 to 15%. So the U.S. has tremendous capacity for growth, in other words. If you look at the percentage of the total water uh, you know, supply, then you see that Singapore is actually a leader in terms of water reuse relative to the total amount of water. Israel second and the U.S. is actually not doing too bad when you look at it as a percentage of the total water, you know, supply. All right, so technologically speaking, and, and I'm not going to go through a lot of technical details, but just to say when you treat water uh, for reuse, you go through a pretreatment step, which basically means you have to remove particles, you have to uh, <coughs> do uh, certain removal of microorganisms, so there is a biological treatment to remove some organics. Then you go through a finer step of solute rejection, which means you have to remove minerals uh, that may be there in excess, viruses, and again, also bacteria. This is usually done with membranes. Think about those as just being filters that allow you to separate things that are down to the molecular level. And then, because this process is not 100% uh, in terms of recovery, in other words, for every gallon of water, you may be producing 70%, uh, 80%, or 90% of uh, product water, the rest is a concentrated stream that now has to be managed in some way. What you see at the bottom are just uh, different type of membranes going all the way from this area where you see basically a multi-channel. This is a hollow fiber, so the water flows through the pores that you see in here. This area is porous, so under pressure, water will then permeate through the walls in here, and then it's collected. Those uh, things can be put into uh, elements like this, or there are other membranes uh, type devices where you actually wrap things around a tube in order to get a lot of area per unit volume and then the water is collected through the central tube in here. So, whoops, all right. So now let's go back to, to Israel. I said that Israel has uh, unlimited supply of water. Unfortunately, it's all saline. And this is what leads us to the next uh, topic. So just to put us in the right sort of uh, ballpark uh, when we talk about salinity, uh, in the United States, the guidelines for drinking water is about 500 milligrams per liter, or half a gram per liter of uh, total dissolved solids or salts. Uh, Seawater has about 35 grams per liter of salt, and what we call brackish water is anywhere between 35 grams per liter of salt and about uh, one gram of uh, salts uh, per liter of water. Now, when you look at, at Israel in here, this is a map of salinity. So basically what it shows you is areas of high salinity that are in excess of 600 milligrams per liter. You see along the aquifers, that we, uh, along the coast, that we have areas where 
Uh, seawater intrusion is also leading to rise in uh, water salinity, and that becomes a problem because the more water that you pump, the more the seawater will intrude into the aquifer. Uh, also in the south, although I'm not going to go into it in great detail, in the south and the Negev, there are actually ancient you know, groundwater uh, resources, but very heavy in salinity, also very heavy in terms of uh, its mineral contents, in terms of calcium, even uh, sulfates. Uh, so it's a challenge, and there is a lot of effort and research that is ongoing to try and figure out how to reuse this water, and in some places, perhaps how to grow plants that will be able to survive with such water. Now, the cost of water in terms of desalination and particularly seawater has been going down over the years. Uh, and there are predictions that uh, perhaps by uh, 2025 and later, the cost of desalted water is going to be on par even with water reuse and fresh water treatment. It's not there yet, okay, but uh, those are some of the projections. But by all means, it already means that desalinated water uh, is a portfolio that can be considered in various areas, again, depending on the need and how much one is willing to pay for this water. Now, if you're worried, uh, if you're worried that uh, desalination, wa desalination of water is extremely expensive, I wanted to just put it in perspective for you. So on this plot, what you see is the average cost of uh, uh, energy per 360 gallons of water, which is about the average consumption in the US in a residential home. So what is important, remember that I told you that you don't produce 100%. What that means is that, imagine if you take seawater, if I squeeze all the water out, I'm going to be left with what? Solid salt, okay? Obviously, you cannot operate in that way. And so, uh, typically, seawater uh, desalination facilities operate at about 40 35% to about 40% recovery. The remainder is put back into the sea. So if you operate at an even lower rate, just to give you an example, at about 10% recovery, the cost of producing water for one household from seawater desalination would be equivalent to running your laptop you know, for a full day. Well, most of us don't do that, right? But it gives you an idea. On the other hand, if we were to desalinate at 75%, which means we extract 75% of each gallon of water as drinking water, that's equivalent to running your refrigerator for a day. All of a sudden, it doesn't look you know, that uh, scary, right? So always when people tell me, oh, desalination is very expensive, I always ask, relative to what? And they say, it's an energy hog. And I say, so is your refrigerator, okay? It uses only energy, okay? So is your car, it only uses energy. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say here that desalination is cheap. All I'm saying is that it has to be put in the proper perspective. All right, so what you see from this plot is that the more water that you squeeze out from salted water, the higher the cost. And therefore, one has to decide where to operate with respect to energy, but there is an additional you know, component, uh, and I'll tell you about this in a minute, which basically means the more, <clears throat> the more that you uh, produce, the more difficulty that you will have with mineral salts and their precipitation, and that will raise uh, the cost or the, the management of the concentrate. So let me just show you just pictorially what we mean when we talk about desalination plants today, specifically those that are used for reverse osmosis. And I want to emphasize that when I use the term desalination, I don't mean necessarily just seawater. Desalination is really a process for removing salts for wa from water uh, and along with other contaminants that uh, can also be removed in that way. So what you see at the top, that's a plant in uh, Orange County in California that takes municipal wastewater in its tertiary treatment step uh, desalt it, and then basically there is a recharge. That water is put back into uh, groundwater. That plant is about you know the size of the largest plant that uh, have been built in Israel. But this is not for seawater. Now what you see at the bottom is a plant that was just built in California at Carlsbad, and that's 50 million gallons per day. And the reason I'm showing you that is because this plant was built by an Israeli company, by IDE. Uh, and this plant has been operated, uh, been in operation for about 
uh, I think six months or, or thereabout. Now, what you see at the bottom is a much smaller plant that produces only about 16,000 gallons per day. That's enough drinking water for about 32,000 people. Uh, this is a plant that we built, and I'm showing it to you not to impress you that we can build small plants, but just to show you that the elements, this is the element for reverse osmosis in here, is actually the same size as the elements in the large plant. In other words, it's scalable, and that's what makes this technology very nice, because you can build a small plant and large plants, and they use basically the same uh, components uh, for separating salt from water. So, in terms of cost for desalination, the energy is about 38%. Uh, there are other costs, uh, including capital costs, including labor, uh, chemicals, and so on. Uh, in terms of energy, we are already where we can be today in terms of what uh, thermodynamics would allow us, uh, which basically means that to reduce costs, we have to reduce capital costs, we have to reduce operational costs. If we go to brackish water, Basically, I won't go through the details here, but basically what you see in here in the white, uh, this is quite variable. This is what you would pay for in order to get rid of the concentrate that is generated. And depending on where you are, it can cost a lot or very little. In some places, you can take the concentrate and inject it into, uh, you know, deep well injection, sort of geological, you know, uh, formation. In California, you can't do that, right? Some places you can take the concentrate and put it in ponds and let it evaporate. California, you can't do that. So uh, it all depends, in other words, what, what you would be allowed to uh, from a regulatory viewpoint. But let's go back to Israel and say that Israel recognized that desalination of seawater is going to be very, very important. And so between 2001 and 2016, there was a... Uh, uh, a flurry of activities and building a variety of desalination plants uh, along the coast, uh, starting, uh, as you see here, Ashkelon, which at the time that it was built was the world's largest, and also the lowest cost. Costs have actually increased, and there was a lot of confusion in terms of cost, because usually when you look at what the cost of desalinated water is, uh, when a plant is being built, it's being bid for, so it's being bid for at a price, you know, for the product water. But once the plant is built, uh, no surprise, often it's discovered that the cost is a little bit higher than what you bid for. So in here, you can see the prices about uh, the lowest, about 56 uh, cents for a cubic meter of water. Uh, the highest is about 73 cents for a cubic meter of water. When you buy a bottle of water, I don't know how much Northwestern paid for this, but uh, a liter of water, you know, often you'll pay about a dollar or two dollars. And if you're at the airport and you really need to buy a bottle of water, you may end up paying three dollars, you know, not even for a liter. So imagine here, uh, you're only paying, you know, about half a dollar or slightly above for a thousand bottles of water, you know, each being one liter. So kind of let's put it in, in perspective. So Israel right now, desalinated water, seawater, supplies, you know, somewhere around 50%. I've heard, uh, you know, some say closer to 60%, but the goal is eventually to go up to maybe even 80% uh, of uh, desalted water that will supply the need in terms of uh, drinking water. So, uh, I'll just show you two slides that show uh, some of the innovations in terms of desalination plants. This is the plant in uh, Hodera. And one of the things that is unique here uh, is that you see that it was built sort of lengthwise. And the reason for that is so that it will not take a large portion, you know, of the shore, okay, or near the shore. And that in itself was sort of an innovation because I won't go into the engineering complexity, but in order to do it in that way, you have to do it with the right train uh, of what comes first. And, uh, uh, you know, there are cost issues and uh, engineering issues, but it was done. Now, another one, which is the more recent one, that's the Sorek plant, which is uh, the largest. Uh, what is unique here, you, in the previous slide that I showed you, the membrane elements were all horizontal. And this is the first plant in the world where the membrane elements were, in fact, vertical. 
And that in itself required quite a bit of innovation in trying to figure out how to make that work to make sure that things, you know, the membranes don't, you won't have any sagging, you know, of the membranes, uh, hydraulics of the system, and so on. And those were also the first large plants with 16-inch element as opposed to 8-inch element, which is for most uh, of the conventional plants. So what that does is actually reduces capital costs significantly because you now you can pack uh, a lot more in uh, a smaller space. So again, innovation in engineering. Uh, it's been estimated that if 80% of, uh, if Israel will generate about 80% of its urban potable water from seawater, that would amount to about 1.3% uh, of its uh, national energy consumption. Now, some say that if you rely on the, on the concept of producing more in the evening, where the cost of electricity is down, or where there's really a waste because you're not using that much, but the uh, power plants still have to run, you know, you can't shut them down, then you can produce this water uh, during such time that this cost would be much, much cheaper. I won't go as far as to say that it'll go down to zero, okay, but it could uh, if, if, uh, if you're doing it in a very smart way. But uh, from a strategic viewpoint, uh, it makes sense uh, for a country such as Israel. The other issue is that of uh, open seawater uh, intake and discharge, and experience in Israel has shown that the impact on the local uh, marine ecology is not as severe as people, you know, have believed. Now, there is a lot more experience in, uh, in the Gulf states in terms of uh, water desalination plants. And so typically, you know, people ask me and they say, isn't it problematic in terms of environmental issues? And I always say, for any, engine, any plant that you build, no matter what it is for, whether it's for producing uh, automobiles, or whether it's uh, a refinery, whether it's uh, a food you know, processing facility, you have to make sure that it's environmentally compatible. And I don't have time here uh, to talk about all the details of what goes into it, but there are a lot of technical details in terms of how do you handle discharge to minimize the impact of basically discharging high salinity water to make sure that the local impacts are minimal. So the question is, would desalination provide sufficient capacity of reliable water sources to promote cooperation between Israel and its neighbors? I'm not a politician, so I can't really answer that question. But what I can offer you is just a few snapshots uh, that I think are interesting. Israel provides, this is just a, a slide of water usage uh, in, uh, in Israel, and this is from the uh, Israel Water Authority, just a recent uh, information that was uh, published. Uh, Israel also provides, in, in agreements that it has, provides water uh, to, to Jordan and also to the Palestinian Authority right here. It's somewhere around maybe 50, 60 million uh, of cubic meters per year. Now, the reason that I put that on there is because if you look at the large plant that I just showed you, Sorek, this is where that plant is in terms of its capacity, and this is where the Ashkelon plant is at that capacity. So what it really means is that as far as uh, Israel is concerned, it makes a lot more sense to produce desalted water, you know, exchange, you know, water at, uh, uh, with the Palestinian Authority and with Jordan you know, rather than go to war, you know, over those resor local resources in that area. So, uh, next, if we think about cooperation, this is the red, uh, I've been very, various proposal, but this is the so-called red dead that you just heard about. And the idea is that you take water, there are two actually proposals. One is you take water from the Red Sea uh, at Aqaba, uh, you will pump this water, through Jordan, and I can't see it from here, but uh, I think this is G uh, in here. Uh, you would have a desalination plant that is right here. Uh, desalt water at that location. You can actually pump some, some water over to Amman, right? And what will happen is that the concentrate will go into the Red Sea. Now, with the Red Sea, it's 392. Dead sea. I mean the Dead Sea, I said. <laughs> uh, to the Dead Sea. 
uh, the water will go to the Dead Sea, which is 392 meters you know, below sea level, so you'll also produce energy okay, at the same time, which will compensate for part of the energy that you need uh, to use for desalination. There have been other proposals to actually uh, do part of the desalination right here at Aqaba and also produce, uh, provide some water to Israel, to, uh, to Elah, to the Arava region, and some will be at Aqaba, and then there'll be some that will be pumped upstream. So, I'm an engineer, uh, I'm a humanitarian, as I told you, and from my perspective, it's quite uh, you know, feasible, possible, that once you begin to actually collaborate, if this comes to fruition, then it makes both countries, you know, both people, you know, dependent you know, on each other. And this is really where, where the collaboration you know, has to come from, you know, from, from that need. Uh, I could stop here if, uh, uh, I don't know how we're doing for time. We should leave some time for questions. Okay, so I, I, can, I, can, basically, uh, I can basically stop here, uh, aside from just putting a plug in for Ben Gurion University, <laughs> if I may. Uh, you know, we, we have been working and developed various uh, monitors to actually monitor those membranes so that we can see when they're is algae that builds on the surface when there is mineral uh, that deposit because if that happens the plants have to be shut down and and that becomes critical but at the time when we developed it we didn't have really a place to test it so we went over to the Negev you know to Ben Gurion University which has a wonderful pilot you know facility in here this is where I was younger <laughs> and uh, we've actually tested uh, you know, this technology along with uh, Israeli technology for doing what they call feed flow reversal, where the flow flows in one direction, and then when you need to clean, you reverse the flow, and our monitor, you know, basically dictates or tells us when it is that we can uh, reverse the flow. And so, with that, you know, we brought this technology back to the US, you know, after it was tested in Israel, and we were able to actually build a, large, a larger scale system that you see in this uh, trailer that actually takes the worst water, uh, agricultural drainage water, you see the green water at the bottom, and then once it goes through a number of steps, it actually produces drinking water. So there's an additional reason why I'm showing you this, because uh, in the first step, where you see here microfiltered water, we're actually using an Israeli you know, technology you know, for microfiltration uh, in here. So you see that technology uh, goes you know, both ways, and that uh, my hope is that uh, we can benefit you know, from it. And I will leave it as such, you know, that point, and then if there are any questions, maybe I'll get a chance to tell you about a few other things. Thank you, Yoram, for that, that interesting overview of technology and the opportunity to use that for various kinds of solutions. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Please go ahead. We just have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll break for lunch. There's been a, there's been a lot of hype lately about the water gem extraction of water from human air. But from the numbers that you've shown, it sounds like it's not Extraction such, of water from air? From human air, right, the water heat exchange. Right. And um, from the water, numbers you've shown, it seems like it's really a lot of hype. It's not such a big advance. Could you comment? Well, you answered your question. Okay. okay. Uh, a lot of hype. Oh, okay. uh, yes, there is water in air. And sailors have known about it, you know, since the beginning of time. You basically, uh, I sail a bit. Uh, you can take a sail or a cloth and at night, uh, there'll be condensation, and you can have enough water, you know, just to maybe have a gulp, you know, or two. Uh, so you can, you can do that. The, the problem is that in order to take water from air, you have to condense it. To condense, you have to take, you know, you have to input energy. It's not, it's not free. And the cost of water, you know, to evaporate or condense water, you have to pay for that phase change. So where does it make sense? Uh, the U.S. Army, for example, is willing to pay a lot of money, or can pay a significant amount of money, uh, to perhaps produce water from, from air. 
okay, where it is needed and there is no other source. But in terms of large-scale capacity, that doesn't, doesn't pan out. So that's an interesting question because this is a problem that my colleagues are working on at Northwestern here, and it just so happens that one of them uh, has a hand up to ask a question, Nilesh Patankar from uh, Northwestern Mechanical Engineering. Yeah, well, I, I want to recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Ken Park. He does uh, make such surfaces to suck moisture from atmosphere. And uh, definitely, I think that it is a viable source. I'm um, uh, not necessarily disagreeing with him, but I'm not as, as pessimistic, uh, as a supplementary source of water. And especially at locations where uh, the centralized strategy, such as desalination, large-scale production is not viable, in remote locations, it could be a viable supplementary source. And we have done some numbers, and we are trying to work on that technology to see whether we can prove it. So I haven't, uh, or my colleagues, we haven't proved it yet, but I think the numbers are viable for remote supplementary source. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, you, have to, you have to realize that uh, no matter what technology you use, when it comes to a phase change, the enthalpy of vaporization or condensation you have to pay for. So on a large scale, thermal uh, methods of producing water is much more expensive. Uh, on a small scale, like I said, you know, it might be, but for the type of volumes that we need for urban you know, centers, for large population center, is just too unwieldy. So I have a question, actually, if I may. So um, I'm here. I'm, I'm willing to have an argument. That's OK. No. <laughs> I will have an <laughs> argument with you over lunch. But uh, right now, I really have a question that you could answer. So uh, brine uh, management uh, that you mentioned in the end, can that be used for salt production, or why is it not used? For, you said for soil salt production? Salt production, yeah. Salt production. Salt. That's a, that's a good question. So uh, let, let me say that uh, first it depends what kind of salt. Uh, salt is produced if it's, uh, you know, the majority, if you look at seawater, uh, it's much cheaper to produce salt just by evaporation. And uh, you can't compete with that. Uh, on the other hand, in some locations, uh, for example, uh, areas where you might have high calcium and uh, sulfate, you can produce gypsum. Uh, in California, there are some locations we produce, can produce 98% purity gypsum. Gypsum is just drywall. But it's so cheap that the only reason, you know, that one would actually use that as a commodity is to lower your cost of brine management. But it won't be profitable. If you look at other sources of salt, you know, Israel, the Dead Sea supplies, you know, certain salts, you know, more than 50% of the world's production. So to compete with that, you know, through water desalination and using that salt is just uh, economically doesn't make sense. All right, so we have a question here from Antonio, who's a graduate student here at Northwestern. Um, how do you guys deal with the micropollutants in the agricultural water reuse or whenever you're in a recycling project of water? How would you deal with the emerging pollutants that can be in the water? Uh, are you interested in doing a PhD or a postdoc? <laughs> postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's in, in uh, one of the nice things about, so I'll, I'll split, you know, I'll, I'll give you an answer in two parts. One, for the product water, uh, most membranes, specifically reverse osmosis membranes, are pretty good barrier, you know, against most, and I say against most contaminants, including emerging contaminants. Uh, if you're interested, I can refer you to a paper that we wrote some years ago to actually analyze and predict what will pass through and what will not. I think the issue more is in terms of the concentrate, uh, because this is where whatever is not rejected by the membranes will end up in that concentrated stream, and how do you deal with it? So, uh, again, the, the answer is site-specific. Uh, in areas where you can have evaporation and it's allowed, then that's one way of, of dealing with it. Now the question is, what do you do with the solids that remain you know, after, right? Uh, it may be also in some uh, instances where uh, folks are looking into uh, 
various processes for post-processing. In other words, to uh, just like you would do with wastewater, right? Whether it's biological treatment and other type of treatments to deal with the concentrate itself. The problem is, how do you deal with biological treatment when the salinity is so high? So I don't have the answer yet. Okay, Thank you. Question in the front, and then there's one back. You know, my, I think. You, you know, I thought you made a nice point about, you know, doing desalination just say, off hours, and that's thinking an integrated process. In many ways, and, and when I talk about it, I'm starting to talk about fresh water is actually an energy storage device. Yes, yes. And, all, and, 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 it, and it's part of an integrated system that I think Israel is there. I have some ideas in there. I'll talk to you later on about that. But I think it's, it's a good thought to think about, but it's not generally accepted yet. So I don't know if you want to discuss no, I, that any further. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, in fact, uh, in Israel, they're thinking about this right now because uh, desalination is now at an overcapacity. So what do you do with all this water? I mean, I've even heard folks that were talking about maybe we should pump water all the way to the, to the Sea of Galilee, to the Kinneret, you know, and, and uh, put water in there. Uh, I'm not sure that that's such a good idea, but you can certainly store that water hydraulically, you know, so you have all this hydraulic energy. Uh, so it may make sense, specifically if you overproduce, let's say, during the night, uh, and use that as a means for storing energy. I think it's recharge, definitely. Recharge the aquifer? You can recharge the aquifer. That's, that's another, where, where it's needed. So in California, for example, you recharge the aquifer because, A, we're not allowed to put uh, treated wastewater you know, back into, this, uh, into the system, into the drinking water system, and it's used to actually prevent or halt seawater intrusion. So that makes sense. But you can also use it for storage and then reuse later where it makes sense. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned that thermodynamically we aren't able to lower our energy costs um, for desalination, but where do you see um, our ability to improve membrane technology to lower the cost of desalination going in the future? Good question. Uh, what I said was, and, and let, let me just uh, phrase uh, you know, what you just said, it's not that thermodynamically we cannot, it's that we're near the thermodynamic limit. So even if we make membranes that are more permeable, since we basically reached a point where when a plant operates, the osmotic pressure of the concentrate uh, basically would equal the pressure that you apply at the feed, there is no more flux okay, at that point, no permeation. So you've reached at that point, and we can build plants that operate you know, up to the optimal you know, level. However, if we make membranes that are more permeable, as an example, that means that we can reduce the plant footprint, which means that we can produce more in a smaller area. But it also means that we have to push more water through the membrane, a higher flux. If we go through a higher flux, it also means that we are more likely to foul the membrane because as you filter more water through uh, at a given location in a membrane, uh, you can have mineral scaling, you can have fouling, so now you have to make membranes that have higher resistance to fouling and mineral you know, scaling. And possibly, if those membranes need to be cleaned using various chemicals, and uh, there is a whole list, whether you use chlorine, whether you use uh, uh, you know, high pH, low pH, now you have to make sure that your membranes are more robust as well. So there is room you know, for uh, improvement in membrane materials uh, and improving uh, membrane performance. Uh, to lower the cost. Not the energy cost so much, but it will reduce capital costs, operational costs. All those things are important because capital cost plus operation is about 60% of the overall cost. So even if you improve it by 10%, 20%, that can be significant for a large plant. Okay, so we can just take a couple more questions. There's one here and one final one. Okay, let me preface by saying no question is a stupid question, right? Um, I come from a really different discipline than the cross disciplines in this room. I come out of the business world. And um, I was here last year because of how I feel about Israel and the Middle East, and I'm also half Chicago, half Los Angeles. So I, I worry about water. 
but because there is no public policy about water, maybe what's really missing here is, is people from the PR world. You sit in restaurants and you see water being put on, on tables all over the world that's being thrown away. But there is no public policy about doing these things. I very often leave a restaurant and ask the manager not to do that unless someone asks for water. Can these kind of water um, savings really amount to anything if the public was really aware that water is not infinite? That's, again, it's a very good question because you, you hit on two points. One, you asked, will it amount to anything? And two, uh, and I, I imagine that what you're asking is, what is the benefit of, of doing this? And those are really a little bit different because would it amount to anything in terms of, will it make a difference in terms of the total volume, okay, reduction? Uh, not in terms of drinking water, you know, whether you, 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 you drink one glass or two glasses, that's not going to make a big difference. But I think what it will do is shift, uh, you know, the psyche, you know, of, of people. Because if you get to the mode of saving water, then perhaps you will put uh, a low volume uh, toilet, uh, you know, flushing in, in your home, right? Uh, then perhaps you're not going to leave your uh, sprinkler you know, system on just because it's, uh, you know, pleases you. Or perhaps you'll change your lawn from uh, uh, being, you know, green grass in Los Angeles to perhaps native plants. So you're going to use less water. And in many homes, 50% of our, uh, 40 to 50% of your home water usage, if you have landscape, it'll be landscape irrigation, right? So I think in that sense, it, it makes sense to do that because then we all become more aware and more sensitive uh, to conserving, you know, water and, and pushing, you know, and being advocates for uh, uh, water savings, you know, all around, not just in, in our own domain. So that, that's a great point. And I wanted to emphasize one thing there. So my colleague Ashlyn Stilwell from the University of Illinois has recently examined water use in the U.S. and domestic household water use more than half is outside the home. So we think that most of the water we use for drinking, but in fact, more people, most people use more water for watering their lawn and washing their car than drinking. So I, I think it's this overall change in attitude is, is extremely important. Now, what I wanted, I, and, and I, I'll have to ask Ellie for forgiveness, <laughs> uh, but there is something very important that uh, I was hoping somebody would ask, but, but they didn't. Uh, and it's something that I came across recently, although I knew about it. Uh, it didn't really dawn on me uh, until uh, actually a few days ago when I looked at uh, the water reuse in Israel versus water reuse in the, in, the, in the West Bank or with the Palestinian Authority. Israel 82 in the settlements, Israeli settlements in the West Bank, about 20% and almost nil, you know, in... in uh, in the Palestinian Authority, you know, region. And so when we're talking about uh, earlier uh, discussion about water and what that implies in terms of negotiations, this is a case where a lot can be done in order to, in order to help uh, the Palestinian, you know, authority. And if you look at Israel, 93% of the water that is treated is in centralized facilities in the West Bank, about 50% is in septic tanks and direct discharge. So if you're talking about where can we make a difference, you know, it's tremendous. And this is something that, uh, you know, in my view, at least if it's done, we don't hear about it. Uh, but this is an area where it's not just technology. You know, it's, it's a lot of, you know, policy issues, uh, negotiations that have to go into it, but this is an area where I think we can do better. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. This is something we'll pick up after lunch as well. So one final question. Okay, so um, desalination plants are often centralized and you uh, process large quantity of water and then you have to distribute. And I believe distributing water can cost money. Um, I think the small modular, uh, small unit that you showed was really nice. You can, um, 
you don't have to make a big plant and can be installed at the small locations. So if you install a small modular unit like this at the well scale, um, then you don't have to spend money to distribute the water. So I, I wonder um, under what condition you think this would be competitive compared to making a big desalination plant? Excellent question. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a strong believer that, you know, the idea is and what, what I'm calling the uh, R3, you know, or R cubed, you know, the right water in the right place, you know, for the right use. Uh, and that basically means that in some areas having large scale desalination doesn't make much sense. Uh, and where smaller systems can be used. Uh, and what I was trying to show you is that the technology itself, in fact, is amenable you know, to scale up from small, you know, to large. So uh, it, it has to be, uh, you know, th those decisions are made at the local scale. Uh, local governments has to do with financing. Uh, I always joke, uh, you know, with our, uh, you know, at UCLA and even in speaking with our chancellor at one, uh, at one time years ago, you know, I said that, uh, you know, when, uh, when we all, you know, run out of water, I said, we'll still have a few portable systems here. I said, so we're going to make it big. You know, we'll have our own system uh, to, to generate water. Uh, you can use distributed systems, uh, but I can't really give you a number and tell you that if you produce above a certain amount, it has to be local or uh, distributed. It really depends on the local issues. But the technology is there, and you can do it. However, uh, what you have to remember is that if it's seawater, there are issues. Uh, for example, uh, in Israel, uh, you can build a plant, get it permitted very quickly. California, the Carlsbad plant, took about eight to 10 years just to get a permit. And a lot of it had to do with also the discharge, environmental issues. If you have a small plant, you still have a discharge. The kind of permit that you would have to have and the money that you would have to spend will not be any less you know, than if you have a large plant, right? And so you, know, you, you very quickly get into the economics of can I really, I, technologically I can build a small one, but can I afford to actually operate it, pay for all the permits and so on and so forth. And so it depends, you know, from place to place it'll be different, uh, but technologically we can do that. Uh, you know, the rest is uh, up to others.